150 delegates, seven speakers, three vast infrastructure projects worth more than £10 billion. still going through changing previous regimes and systems, coming with changes particularly to the planning system but also to economic development with the abolition of the Regional Development Agency and the creation of local <coughs> enterprise partnerships. So the actual policy platform for schemes is, is very important if we're to enable those schemes to move forward as hopefully we move out of recession. One with which I'm particularly associated, I'm the chair of the Superport Committee uh, for Liverpool City Region uh, and we've recently released this document, it's the Action Plan about delivering economic growth within Superport. Superport very much focused on the maritime sector within Liverpool City Region but also extending up the Manchester Ship Canal to Liverpool, to uh, Manchester. Uh, built on its great maritime trading centre, uh, Liverpool City Region's ports, airports, road rail and logistics assets uh, are a very important economic driver for the region. What we need to do is develop into new lucrative markets, these are the emerging markets, Brazil, China, Russia, India, and take advantage of those by actually looking outwards for future economic growth. There are major changes happening uh, in the world. One of them, particularly in respect to the maritime sector, is the widening of the Panama Canal. That will create new trading routes. 
and Liverpool City Region being a West Coast port is incredibly well located to take advantage of that. Indeed, that's why Liverpool was established. Many of these new emerging markets are actually areas of empire, such as India. So we need to look at how we, in, in terms of marketing the region, take advantage of that, and that's very much what the action plan is about. Uh, retailers and manufacturers are increasingly seeking port-centric locations close to large centres of population to base value-added activities. That reduces their freight costs, reduces duplication in handling of goods, and reduces the time goods take to reach the customer. So there's great opportunities within that warehousing sector on Merseyside, uh, and the report particularly looks at the availability of land and the potential for a growth in that sector. Liverpool, ideal location to take advantage of these trends, but also to meet the increasing agenda which companies have to meet for low carbon uh, and actually bringing freight much cl closer to the northwest uh, has particular advantage, also putting it on rail. So it's another area which the Action Plan particularly looks at. The individual schemes within the Action Plan is 1.8 billion of new infrastructure developments building upon existing assets, but also creating new assets. So these projects, for example, include our own project for the development of deep water post Panamax in River Terminal at Seaforth. Includes 3MG, the multimodal gateway operated as a partnership between Stobart's, Holton Borough Council and the major expansion plans there. And all in all, when we look at all the projects, we've carried out an economic analysis through a company called Amien, and the projects could deliver 21,000 new jobs and an addition of 6.1 billion of GVA by 2020. So incredibly important. And alongside that physical infrastructure, the action plan sets out an operational program for engaging operators, importers and exporters uh, in, in delivering the vision. It'll be driven forward by a committee. Uh, other people on the committee include Steve O'Connor, Stobart's Group, his vice chair, but and many from the public sector. Just to say a word also on Atlantic Gateway. Uh, I sit on the shadow board of the, of the Liverpool Let, uh, and also developing is an Atlantic Gateway partnership body, which will encompass representatives of the three LETs from Greater Manchester, Liverpool City Region, Cheshire and Warrington, and also the local authority groupings. And that's emerging, and that's particularly <coughs> looking at sectors which in fact geographically run across the whole area between Liverpool and Manchester. Um, it's looking at the supply chains, but it's also looking at harnessing the areas, areas natural resources, water, wind, biomass, and also energy from waste. <coughs> and it's looking at also creating skilled communities based around working, learning environments, focusing particularly on knowledge sectors, technology, media, and science, and our major project over in Manchester just coming to conclusion Media City. Please go and have a look at that as it opens up for public access, uh, a major scheme and a major potential in the Greater Manchester area. So we're seeking to build on the momentum uh, of these existing schemes and emerging schemes through partnership working on Atlantic Gateway with the public sector to bring forward major projects for economic growth in the region. <coughs> An extraordinary long-term view, doesn't it? How do you factor in, you know, short-term difficulties like those we're enduring right now? Well, you, you have your long-term targets and you, you stick to those, but um, you flex, I think, is the, the word we tend to, tend to use. Um, obviously, at the moment, for example, take the housing market, the housing market particularly difficult. So now's the time to sort of get planning permissions in place to do preparatory work to get sites in order um, to, so that when the market comes back you're well placed you review schemes to see whether they're still focused on market potential moving forward and you take opportunities to to amend schemes so that they're more attuned to where you think the opportunity will be uh, and all times of difficulty also bring potentials so you look at what might come out of uh, changing in markets uh, and opening up new opportunities. But there will always be sectors of the market which are strong at any particular time. 
and the energy sector for example has been particularly strong in the last few years and we're now moving in this area with the offshore wind schemes coming on stream uh, into another area of opportunity so it's having the flexibility to, to adjust your business model to take advantage of the opportunities wherever they lie. Yeah, because I was kind of wondering, I mean, I know it's not specifically an area of, 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 your, um, of yours right now, but if you look at Liverpool, for example, you might argue that it's currently kind of oversupplied with apartments. So. Now, presumably the appeal, you factor in the idea that sometime the upturn will come, the demand for property will come back, but that's quite a nerve-wracking business, is it not? Um, well, we're large company and diverse, that's one of the strengths of the diversity. If you look at the underlying situation in the housing market, we're building about um, 100,000 units a year nationwide. Um, the lowest number since 1923, I think, is a statistic I've seen. Uh, and the actual household creation is 200,000 a year. So we're only building half of what we need. Um, house builders are moving into more secure niches in the market, so they tend to be moving away from first-time buyers into the larger parts of the market. So we're storing up a problem for ourselves. Um, I don't think the underlying situation that there's going to be a shortage of dwellings moving forward changes. Um, the, the problems are very much driven by difficulties of obtaining mortgage finance. I think if those are addressed, then the market will come back and, and it's being prepared, having planning permissions in place have the ability to deliver those, mark, those as the market returns. Okay, Peter, thank you very much indeed. Um, as I said, um, Peter and everybody else will be fielding your questions later, and I'm delighted to say that Malcolm has uh, sneaked in on my left, and he'll be speaking uh, later on. Um, uh, but in the meantime, could I invite um, Steve Nicholson to uh, address us now? Um, um, uh, Peter speak, spoke about Liverpool reaching out to the rest of the world again. Um, this is about reaching out across the Mersey. Um, uh, I should have said also, um, our speakers can choose to speak either from their seats or from the lectern. Yeah, just a few moments about Mersey Gateway. I'm the project director. I've uh, been involved with the project um, since the back end of 2005, early 2006. And at that time, we were very much uh, at the end of the feasibility stage of Mersey Gateway, even though the project had been around probably longer than people care to remember. It was very much at the cusp of um, persuading government or otherwise whether this project was something it wanted to see happen. Now we secured government funding support in March of 2006 and we set about delivering the project through the planning and procurement phase over a five year period. And not least the sort of window of opportunity there was coincident with what was thought to be the lifetime of a government because one of the issues uh, challenging infrastructure in the UK, <coughs> large infrastructure projects, they do have a long gestation period and almost inevitably you need to keep stakeholder interests intact, particularly the government of the day. So we didn't quite manage the five years and uh, when the collection came uh, last year, we were wait still waiting for our planning decision and we found ourselves sort of pitched into a spending review uh, administered by the new coalition government, of course. Now that really was a, you know, quite a blow for the project preparation. We had a, a, a large team actively engaged. We were on the cusp of uh, launching procurement. And we had to change tack to deal with uh, the spending review criteria, you know, looking at whether how well Mersey Gateway stacks up to the spending review. And the answer, obviously, is uh, known to everybody now that uh, we came out of it with flying colours. In fact, I was just looking at the spending review report and Mersey Gateway is mentioned on the second page of the executive summary as being one of the pro projects that's recognised as needed, indeed, to support economic growth. Uh, it's nice to see it coming ahead of Crossrail and High Speed Rail and all those other projects. So, in fact, we, we were wondering at one stage whether we'd overplayed this and... Um, particularly when we got the Chancellor visiting uh, the estuary overlooking the, the site of the new bridge. But it's great that we've got that political support and it always has benefit for, benefited locally and regionally from cross-party support because self-evidently there's a compelling case to do something about the failing to the Jubilee Bridge. So, where are we now? Well, uh, this week I had the pleasure of uh, hosting a, a major industry day attended by about 130 representative firms keen to build a bridge and 
The contractual arrangements we're looking to put in place are pretty complex because we're not just looking for a competent party to build a complex structure and to maintain it, uh, to deliver it on time. We're also looking for a, a maintenance agreement that will deliver high quality services over 30 years. Just to give you a feel for that, the business will represent something between 50 and 70 million a year so, and run for 30 years. So this is, in its own right, a large enterprise. Of course, we've now got full planning approval. The decision came out in December, which gave us full planning approval. So we are now looking to make this project a reality. But what are its benefits? Well, some of its benefits are direct. You know, the, the, the benefits that are directly related to removing a transport bottleneck in our system that is really having a key impact on the attractiveness of the area for inward investment, the reliability of transport and travel. And we can, we, we can with some confidence, expect to deliver those benefits. Improve journey time reliability, removal of congestion, the fact that Mersey Gateway will provide an alternative to the other crossings of the Mersey. And this is, on, again, on a very large scale in transport terms. If you look at the number of trips that cross the river from the tunnels uh, to also the centre of Liverpool and travelling east towards Thurwall, the M6 crossings, including Silver Jubilee Bridge, around half a million trips a day cross that river. And each of those crossings at the moment are at or near capacity. That means you've got absolutely zero network resilience. Businesses are continually having to grapple with uncertain travel times and journey times. What Mersey Gateway will do will open up an opportunity where travel is reliable <coughs> and transport can be planned. And that will last for many years. We're not just looking at something that will come and fill up the traffic in five years. The scheme is designed to have capacity for the foreseeable future. And as time ticks by, that choice will become increasingly attractive. So what comes with that is that we're also looking at improving the corridor and we have a local regeneration strategy which is centred on Silver Jubilee Bridge because 80% of the traffic will transfer to the new bridge. This opens up major opportunities locally in South Widnes and Runcorn Old Town to use the approach roads and the corridors of Silver Jubilee Bridge for more local priorities. Uh, greater opportunity for land use because you can gain access to roads which you are currently denied because they are used for regional purposes. And this is the package of improvements that are now very much in place. And, and we have again, I have to say, confidence that they will be deliverable. However, the actual benefit that the Mersey Gateway can bring to the wider region requires a more concerted effort across agent, agencies embracing public and private partnerships. It's important that we start to put that in place now. There's naturally a reluctance to put too much effort into a large program of initiatives, perhaps uh, all uh, dependent on a key infrastructure project happening. We're now at a time where the uncertainty in, against the, the possibility of delivering Mersey Gateway is falling away. And we should start to look in earnest at building uh, coordinated initiatives around it. And that will be the challenge for the future. So not that the Mersey Gateway does indeed provide a catalyst for wider gain in economic performance across the region. Thank you very much. Um, one of the um, areas, of course, that's going to benefit from the, uh, the new bridge is Holton. And on my right is Dick Trigay, who's the Strategic Director for Environment at Holton Borough Council, and he's going to talk about infrastructure in general, I believe. Thanks, Dick. Good morning, everybody. And firstly, can I give apologies from David Parr, the Chief Executive? Uh, I know that David was very keen to, to attend uh, this, this meeting. Uh, he's been a great champion for, for many infrastructure projects, not just in Halton, uh, but across the, uh, the city region uh, and, and the wider region. So apologies for, from David. Uh, I come in to, to stand in his place, and in fact, I, I'm, I'm 
only here for the morning session. My colleague Mick Noon will be taking all the difficult questions this afternoon. I, I, I think from my perspective, Mark, the, the importance for local authorities has been to working with others, but to set the, the right policy background uh, for infrastructure development. And over the years, we've, we've seen various opportunities to do that. The Mersey Gateway has been a strategic policy for Holton Council uh, for many, many years. Uh, but the council it is not a one-trick pony. It is important. It's the, the biggest highway scheme being <coughs> proposed, put forward by one of the smallest uh, local authorities, unitary authorities uh, in the country. But we're much more than that, and we've been working very, very closely with people like Peter Nears, with the Stobart Group, to ensure that other infrastructure developments are brought forward uh, in a timely fashion. The local authority sees infrastructure as absolutely essential, and we're focusing perhaps because of Mersey Gateway uh, on accessibility, movement, but of course it's much more than, than just roads uh, and railway. But in terms of this location, improving accessibility, improving connectivity is seen as absolutely crucial. And it's an issue which has been with us for many years. I recall uh, as a student uh, issues about um, structural problems in the Merseyside region, which was all to do with, with links between Merseyside and the rest of the UK. So there are significant issues for us here. Not just roads, we've been working with colleagues at Mersey Travel, for example, <coughs> to secure the reopening of the Halton Curve, a railway link between North Wales and Chester and into the, the city centre in Liverpool. Again, seen as important as part of a, a balanced, balanced package uh, of proposals to aid commuting, to reduce dependency uh, upon cars. And why are we doing this as a local authority? What's the purpose uh, of all of this? And, and for Halton, one of the key issues, of course, has been problems of, of deprivation within this area. How do we resolve problems of deprivation? It's seen very much as going to the root cause, which is employment, opportunities for work, opportunities uh, for gainful employment. And so all the years that I've been with the council, the main thrust has been on regeneration and development. And development not as an end in itself, but development as a means of creating job opportunities for local residents uh, and others. And again, the local authority in that role sees itself very much as a facilitator, bringing people together. And if we, we take as one example the, the recent uh, development by, by Tesco uh, of a major chilled food distribution facility, it wasn't just the physical development with which we were concerned, it was ensuring that the job opportunities that came from that development were made available to local people. And there were colleagues in the room who worked extremely hard with this college, uh, college indeed, in making sure that uh, people were given the right skills, the right training, and, and the opportunity and the potential to, to gain employment there. And the success story there was that, if I can remember the figures correctly, uh, of some 400 new jobs that were created, over 75% went to Haltonians, to, to, to local people. And I think that issue is linked in to this debate upon infrastructure, because what is infrastructure? It's, it's the totality that, that we're looking at. And wh what we're seeing in Halton is probably very similar to what is happening right across the country. The change in the economic base, the movement away from the, the heavy chemical industry upon which this area was dependent. Dramatic change, the move, uh, as I've mentioned, to the logistics industry, not just Stobart, but a considerable number uh, of other logistics uh, businesses uh, in the area. The move towards the knowledge economy, um, Across the river uh, at Darsby, we have one of the most important, uh, internationally important centres for scientific development. 
All of this is critical in terms of development. There we have a potential for a million square feet of science-related floor space. It depends upon ensuring uh, accessibility is maintained uh, in that area and improved. And it also means that we have to get the, the skills right. And I know this college is working very hard both in terms of academic education, in terms of vocational uh, education, and in terms of other skills, and is focusing very much on the key areas of logistics, the knowledge economy, the chemical industry, which is still so important in this area, and crucially when you think about the number of job opportunities associated with, for example, uh, the Mersey Gateway with construction. So I think as a borough council, we see the debate about infrastructure as being much more than just the physical development of individual projects. It's the totality of it, how it all links together into society. And if I could just make one, one final uh, point, it is this way in which we link things together. The changes that are being brought about uh, following the, the change in government are quite dramatic, and we're finding our way as we establish uh, LEPs, uh, Local Employment Partnerships, uh, as we look at the way in which a regional growth fund uh, is used, the loss of the Northwest Development Agency, indeed the, the, the loss eventually of the Government Office for the Northwest. The way in which the building blocks are held together is going to be a critical issue for us. And again, regional growth, growth fund if I remember the figures correctly, the amount of money that's made available in regional growth fund is about the same, for the whole country, is about the same as the North West Development Agency had for this region alone. And yet, we're losing that potential expenditure, the opportunities there. Regional growth fund directed very much towards uh, job creation, job opportunities in the short term we need to find ways of filling the gap to make sure that the infrastructure doesn't lag behind. And I think that's all Mark I'd like to say. If I can ask you a kind of supplementary question. Uh, we, we heard the bridge, the new bridge, is being described as a catalyst for all sorts of things. What evidence is there to suggest that, you know, that if you build it, you will come and that, that jobs will be created and that inward investment will be attracted? Are there examples that we can point to and say it's worked in the past? Well, I, I, I think I'd turn it round the other way. We know that we have lost jobs because of problems associated with the existing Silver Jubilee Bridge. Um, development companies have come, have seen opportunities and then have decided that it isn't worth the candle because the accessibility is so poor. And it's not that long ago that um, I had a, a phone call from Steve O'Connor, uh, now um, with the Stobart Group. He had just entered into a, a brand new contract, a just-in-time contract, uh, quite a large contract. First day of operation, the Silver Jubilee Bridge had a problem. And he phoned me to let me know, quite politely, that uh, as a consequence of Silver Jubilee Bridge failure, he had failed to meet his contractual obligations on the very first day of a major new contract. With that sort of issue, you can understand why people are not investing in this area. They'll go elsewhere unless accessibility is good, easy, and reliable, and reliability is perhaps the most important of those things. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, as I said at the beginning, um, Louise Elman is a Liverpool MP, she's also chair of the Select Committee on Transport, and as such, I suppose, can take both a kind of practical and uh, political overview of, of several of these projects. So, Louise, please. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm pleased to be here and able to participate in what I think is a very important event. And I'm pleased too to be in the constituency of my colleague Derek Twigg, um, who, who is here with us today. And I chair the House of Commons Transport Select Committee, and we're a cross-party group of MPs. And our remit is to scrutinise, and indeed bring accountability to, 
the Department for Transport and its agencies. And you can see as soon as you start to think about what involves that that is a very, very wide remit. And we certainly have an interest in looking at the whole issue of transport and the economy, and that includes looking at infrastructure. And we hear a great deal of gloom at the moment and pessimism about the economy nationally and the impact on the whole range of spending cuts locally. But today's event, I think, is about being positive, and it's about looking for opportunities, and opportunities in developing infrastructure programmes which predate the last election. And it's also important because all of these projects in their different ways involve the private sector, which is going to be extremely important in allowing the economy to develop and bring growth and indeed bring jobs. And what I'd like to do is to make one or two observations on these specific projects that we're, we're discussing today and hearing detailed presentations about. And first I would say that there are, it's very important to recognise that in looking at infrastructure projects such as those we're talking about today, um, first that needs long-term planning and availability of different types of finance. And it needs strategic thinking focus and some body or some organisation to see those projects through. And doing that may be at odds with the current um, idea of everything being local. And I just throw that out really for your, your consideration that localism is very, very important in many ways, but localism on its own will not deliver or indeed sometimes put together strategic projects which require thinking beyond the locality, although they might originate in the locality, and which need to be delivered. Uh, we've already heard a lot about the, the very important Mersey Gateway project, which I think is vitally important, <coughs> not just to this area, but to, to the region as a whole. And it's about dealing with congestion, but it's about regeneration and economic development in particular. And I think it's vitally important that the infrastructure development there is linked with an economic development strategy, and I think it's vital that those two things go together. And um, the project also has very significant private sector input there. It's originated locally, and I think Halton Borough Council deserve plaudits for putting this together. Uh, but the funding depends a great deal on the private sector and some of the aspects about how that's going to be delivered, how indeed that's going to be put together, I think are, are unresolved. I think that is a challenge, although the project itself is very well on its way and did get the signing off from government only uh, two or three months ago. And Edge Lane Improvements, another project we're going to discuss today, uh, a public sector project, vitally important as a gateway to the city of Liverpool and part of the strategy to develop Liverpool. And indeed, the edge, edge lane improvements were part of the, the strategy put forward and involving Northwest Development Agency, looking strategically at how to develop the potential in the region and specifically in Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool Waters, we've already heard significant detail about the superport proposals. Superport proposals, uh, Liverpool Waters, um, the Atlantic Gateway project, which all of this is a part of, is about developing our assets and developing the waterways, developing ports, but doing them in such a way that there is regeneration across a much wider area with a focus on the ports, but a much wider benefit. And perhaps the most significant thing to note about that is that it is essentially a private sector development, private investment. Um, much more so than the other projects, and I think that's, that is what makes that different. But of course that cannot go ahead without public sector involvement and public sector cooperation, so that is joint, but the initiative there is coming from Peel, is coming from the private sector, and, and I hope this is part of that development. Uh, we do see a, a cruise liner terminal in Liverpool, which will be extremely important in developing the economic progress where so much progress has been made over recent years. But the current problem in developing Liverpool waters is to do with a, a possible clash 
uh, relating to the World Heritage Site. So there is perhaps an issue there, I hope it's one that can be resolved, between economic regeneration and what's needed there, and a possible clash to do with heritage and the requirements of UNESCO and the World Heritage Site. I hope that can be resolved, but I think perhaps we just have to flag that up as a possible, uh, possible difficulty. So I would conclude from, from these projects and from where we are now that this is all positive. Um, this isn't about gloom. This is about doing things. There's been significant public-private sector cooperation in bringing these projects to the stage that they're in now. It is essential that they proceed and are completed. Yes, it is about infrastructure, but it, it is infrastructure linked to economic development and economic growth. And whatever the problems are, I think we should, we should see it, yes, as a challenge, but also as major opportunities, which there is every reason to believe we can be successful in, and within being successful, develop this part of the region and provide jobs and economic growth across a very, very wide area. Um, I'm not going to ask Louise a question because I hope you've got some for her running, running slightly behind schedule. So we kind of stay in, in Liverpool in a, emotionally and practically because uh, Malcolm Kennedy from the City Council there, um, as I said, um, is uh, profoundly interested in regeneration and transport and he's going to speak to us now. Malcolm. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I have to say that after my very good friend Louise Elman has spoken and uh, the gentleman from Halton has spoken, I'm not sure what the Regeneration Cabinet Member f for Liverpool uh, has to say much to, to add to what is said. I, I, I certainly underline what Louise has said about being positive. It's been a very difficult day in Liverpool today. The Cabinet has just agreed the budget for next year. It goes to the Select Committee tonight and then to the full Council next week. And it's very tough times for local government. But uh, as I said to the cabinet not so, so long ago, that just because things are difficult, you can't, you can't abandon the vision of what you're trying to achieve. Um, to, to make some comment about the heritage question, I, I'm also in a difficult situation that uh, technically I'm the heritage champion uh, for, for Liverpool. I'm also the regeneration cabinet member. So it's a a uh, conundrum that I have to, to balance every day. I can say that Liverpool City Council does feel that it's made uh, sufficient compromises in, or feels that sufficient compromises have been made in the planning uh, process so far with regard to Liverpool waters. And there's also a point that when you're building uh, something like Liverpool waters and indeed any infrastructure project, you're hopefully building the heritage of the future um, because everything was brand new at one point and I believe that there were some uh, complaints originally when the liver buildings were going up and that they were too tall and didn't fit into the, uh, the then version of the kind of development framework as it were. Um, so it is important not to lose our vision. The other thing that uh, I think uh, is very important is that Liverpool is either a gateway to the rest of the world and a gateway to this country, or it is nothing. That is why Liverpool is there, and that is why the projects that are being discussed are, are so important. I came to Liverpool in 1974 to be a student. It seemed as if, uh, well, Liverpool is always a fantastic place to be, but certainly when you got to the outskirts of the city, uh, everybody was making it as hard as possible to actually get to the inside of the city. And uh, when there was a quick poll done about uh, uh, the impact of the new administration in Liverpool, the project in Edge Lane gave it uh, a great plus point. Uh, I have to admit that happening a couple of weeks after I became the cabinet member, I can't claim total responsibility for breaking any kind of logjam. But the fact is, people think of the Edge Lane project as being very important to Liverpool. When you've been in a car um, on the Widnes side of the Runcorn Bridge and your train is just arriving at the station 
on the Runcorn side of the bridge, uh, then it, it gives you a, a lesson on how important uh, the Mersey Gateway project is. Um, but there are all things going on, the expense, expansion of the docks. Peel, I had a meeting with Peel Ports. We do know that the infrastructure of the roads around Peel Ports, is, uh, around the docks, is, is really very poor. On a heritage fashion, we've uh, done the Bascule Bridge, but we haven't got the roads in a fit state to service, uh, to service the ports. Um, there are very ambitious projects uh, that we continue in our positive attitude in Liverpool uh, to promote. The new exhibition hall, the cruise liner terminal which uh, Louise has uh, referred to, and of course Liverpool waters that I've already um, dealt with. The leader of Liverpool City Council, Councillor Joe Anderson, said two things very strongly when he came into uh, office. He said, that we had to become a business friendly city and that we had to become a can-do county. And I think uh, taking that positive attitude further, all of us on the, in the cabinet in Liverpool would emphasise that and we will not lose our vision of where Liverpool is going to, to, to go. I haven't mentioned the airport. Every time you go to the airport there's an, in, uh, an improvement in the facilities there, and that again is part of the great uh, improvements uh, that we're bringing about in Liverpool. We've developed the International Gateway uh, Strategic Regeneration Framework that will be going to the Cabinet in March. The North Liverpool Regeneration Framework, an important basis for development in North Liverpool. Plans around developing the low carbon economy in North Liverpool. And just in a quick comment on the LEP, I would say we do have to make sure that above all the LEP takes the strategic interests of the whole city region on board and not uh, slip into just people's pet projects. The ones we're talking about at the moment are really key projects for Liverpool as an economic driver for the rest of the region uh, and the accessibility uh, to, to Liverpool as well. So I hope I've, uh, I've stressed the positive nature, our determination to take these projects forward and to support our neighbouring authorities where they happen to fall in uh, their territory. I mean, the, whole, the, the new bridge is a bridge for Merseyside, it's a bridge for Greater Liverpool, and it is important for the whole economy, just as increasing accessibility to Liverpool is to keep Liverpool's economy uh, going. We have to provide services for the people of Liverpool and that is becoming increasingly difficult. But the fact is that people are in Liverpool and the surrounding areas because there is an economy and Liverpool City Council has found resources in the present circumstances to ensure Liverpool vision is still supported and there will be a development programme going forward. Um, so I look forward to the debate and I hope uh, for, look forward to learning from you and everybody else here on the top table. Thank you very much. The word gateway is much used, isn't it? Um, is this kind of sign of the times? It's a kind of a recognition that, you know, for us to go forward, we now, you know, as picking up what Louise said, localism is not enough. We have to kind of look further afield, and a bit like Barack Obama's Sputnik moment, when you kind of realise that all these emerging, emerging economies are beginning to dominate. I mean, is that the fact of life? I mean, Liverpool, for example, arguably 20 years ago had a bit of a fortress mentality, but now is that it, does it have to open itself up to the world to become the gateway to the world? I can remember listening to my father's record collection of Benny Goodman records and thinking, my God, those records are 30 years old. So the history of Liverpool 30 years ago is well in the past. It's the difference between the Benny Goodman years and the David Bowie years. And uh, the, the fact is Liverpool has the need for more than one gateway. It, the, the, the gateway over the bridge is one way into Liverpool. The gateway from the north and improving at uh, Atlantic Avenue is another gateway and the gateway from the east coming in into the M62. And connectivity 
uh, for Liverpool is fundamental to its existence, its survival and its growth. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Now I'm hoping um, that you have questions to put to our panel. Please indicate, raise your hand up and um, the microphone will find its way to you. There's a gentleman there right at the back with a red tie on, if we can reach him. My name's Tommy Glenn. I'm a director of a limited of a company, a uh, community company by limited by guarantee, within 200 yards of this uh, building today. Um, you're talking about vision and you're talking about the availability of jobs. Uh, I'm back to ask Mr. Nears and Louise where a water feature would fit in. 10, 11 years ago, I did a big presentation on putting a barrier in at Witness to maintain a head of water from Witness to Warrington which would have gave us something like Ulster water, a clear, crystal clear water that would, we would be able to use. And people wouldn't go to the Lake District from London and Birmingham and leave us by. And it would create a lot of jobs. And it would put housing on, top housing, two and three million pound houses that people will buy because it's by the water side. The only problem was that the bridge was in going and uh, the sewage wouldn't have been spent. So Open Border Council said, well, you know, you'll have to leave it until we can sort out something else. Well, now we've got the bridge, I'm wondering if and when I heard a whisper, you might only hear a Chinese whisper, there's a big barrage going on in Egbert to generate electricity. In which case, could it be re re uh, reinstalled the uh, vision I had some years ago of maintaining a water system from here to Wellington, whereby with the new water truck we've got, we could have a ferry from the Witness Waterfront since the car I stop all the wrong car and complain and all, they don't get anything and, uh, and they've got no access to Witness to do the shopping and that would eliminate all that lot. Thank you very much. Well, that was a major scheme as far as I can make out. I'm not sorry for that. <laughs> Um, and it was a, a very large, very expensive scheme. It had very significant environmental issues associated with it. Um, and it was felt to be unimplementable at, at that time. <coughs> Do we have any more questions from the floor? Perhaps I could put one to, to see, which is um, curious. I mean, the, the project, the bridge, sounds great. But a lot of people will be worrying what kind of mayhem will be taking place when construction what, what words you know, can you apply to that? Yeah, indeed. It's, um, it's a major challenge to get the disruption during disruption minimised. And, um, and this is really the phase that the project is now going into where we're looking at a, a micro uh, management of the construction work. So that, um, we do maintain the flow of traffic through the borough. Uh, we'll have to liaise very carefully with um, adjacent crossings as well so that we um, try and maximise the opportunity for traffic to divert at times when we've got some real serious issues with, with our construction phasing. Um, of course, on the upside, there'll be lots of job opportunities during that construction phase. We, we, we recognise as a minimum there'll be around 500 jobs um, created over a sort of four year construction period and all the spin off benefits of that for the local economy. I think communication <coughs> will be the biggest challenge that we face and we'll need to rise to. You know, people will need to know precisely what's going on, how it affects them, so that they, they're aware and then um, out of that we will try and um, create an understanding that a scheme at this scale uh, will disrupt somebody at some time, it's unavoidable. Uh, our, our job is to explain that to people and to get some understanding and to mitigate it as far as it's possible to do so. In a way, the pressure's really on with regard to the bridge, isn't it? Because George Osborne said, look, let's invest in things that are going to make the economy work. It's a kind of a little bit of a test case for this sort of PFI system, which will see the money paid back over 30 years by tolling. I mean, does that add a kind of a burden in the sense that now it's really got to work, hasn't it? It's a nice position to be in, to be honest with you. Um, this time last year, <coughs> when we were in suspension, it was the uncertainty were much more of a problem. Um, having the level of backing we've now got, you know, this is why we do the job. You know, we, we want to get on and deliver projects, and um, and you know, we've got uh, cross-European interest in actually building this um, this scheme, including major UK civil engineering companies. 
and they will be looking for a local supply chain to integrate with. You know, okay, the expertise of this bridge demands pretty exceptional uh, competence and experience, which you'll assume far between and a pan-European interest in what we expect. For they each of the, whoever successfully winning this contract will look to the local community, the local supply chain, the local businesses and support systems. <coughs> and that will be occurring at a time when maybe the, the economy is only just kicking back into gear. <coughs> so it's very important, the timing of this. You know, we'll be uh, engaged in this activity maybe at the, t uh, at the time when uh, opportunities elsewhere are only just beginning to emerge again. And it will be a very critical uh, assist for the construction sector and associated industries. Picking up on that, a question for Louise. I mean, in one sense, with the comprehensive spending review, I mean, the North West and some of its infrastructure projects emerged quite well from that. Is that a fair point? Yes, I, I think that that is fair comment. And we're very anxious about the impact of the comprehensive spending review. And while in some areas it has been very damaging, particularly to well, a lot of the public sector jobs. In terms of transport investments and infrastructure, I think it's been pretty positive, so I think that's good. And some of the positive decisions on that investment were because they were linked to private sector involvement. And I think it's very important that we do capitalise on that and see those projects through. So I think overall, I think it's fair to say, yes, I think it was a lot better than could have been. Well you know, both of you obviously have concerns in Liverpool where you know, public sector jobs are going to take a bit of a hammering. I mean, do these projects have any part to pay to play in, in the government's vision of the private sector filling the void, or is that too much to hope for? It is clear that in, in carrying out these projects, there will be a lot of private sector jobs involved, whether it's to do with construction or to do with supporting businesses that will come out of uh, or regeneration, all of those things bring private sector jobs with them. I think the problem is the timing of that and whether the development of those jobs will actually be an alternative for the many people who may well be losing their jobs in the public sector. So I think the, the jobs are not necessarily equivalent to the timing of certain different, but nevertheless, private sector jobs ought to be welcome. Yeah. I think, uh, well, I'm 57 years old now and I'm being made redundant by the North West Development Agency on July the 7th. Um, somehow I can't see myself going into construction, um, not at that stage of life. Um, but the, the, the fact is that Liverpool City Council is trying to uh, react to this situation. Two major initiatives under my colleague Councillor Nick Small which are the one, the apprenticeship scheme, where we've uh, exceeded our targets for the first year. I think uh, if we can be proud of one thing in Liverpool, I think it's that. Uh, and the second one is the new organisation, Construction Liverpool, where we're wanting to work and, and link these two things together to help uh, local youngsters get into work with construction companies who are, who are working in the, the Liverpool area and developing modular forms of training around that. So we are reacting to the situation, but I think uh, my chances of going into the bridge building industry are, are a fair I'm sure you do brilliant. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I take it there are no more questions from the floor. Um, we're going to take a break for lunch. I've just said that after lunch, we're going to be hearing from uh, Andrew Wilson home from Belfort BT. Um, it's a chance maybe for you to do a bit of mingling and networking. It's also maybe a chance for you to kind of put your heads together about what you've heard and if you fancy popping a question when we come back that will also be um, absolutely great to hear from you and uh, as I say let's enjoy a bit of lunch now. Thank you very much indeed. I'm delighted to say that in the game of musical chairs we're playing, Dick Trugay has left us and uh, Mick Moon has replaced him. Mick is the Operational Director of Highways, Transport and Logistics at Halton Borough Council. And um, by way of easing you in, Mick, um, we heard quite a lot of optimism this morning, but I suppose right now the other side of it is you're dealing with, with budget cuts. What, how does that impact on the future? Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's obviously a major concern for us, as it is for all local authorities, the, the reductions in, uh, in funding that we've got, both in terms of what we'll turn the 
interest transport block and the maintenance block. Um, our block interest transport block, for instance, has gone down by approximately two thirds. Uh, that has an obvious implication in terms of what we can now deliver to the community. Uh, it comes at exactly the wrong time for us as well when we're trying to um, deliver the, the biggest infrastructure project in the country. So, yeah, there, there are major concerns for us, um, but uh, there's a lot of authorities in the same position. Uh, we're working well with the, uh, the Liverpool City region in trying to do what we can. Uh, yeah, our third LTP is about to go to the executive board uh, in a few weeks' time, and that would set out what the uh, programme that we think we can deliver, but as I say, it will be very much reduced, unfortunately. Okay. Um, I'm hopeful that um, over lunch, um, you've thought about asking a few questions of our panellists, so please don't be shy. Um, it gets a bit of a, a debate going, a bit of a chat, so please raise your hand if you have a question for us. Gentleman at the back there. And I'll come to you later in the middle over there. Hi, uh, Oliver Clay, Runcorn Weekly News. Uh, question mainly for Mick Noon. In recent weeks, I've had some questions from strange bedfellows of Ineos Claw and the Green Party criticising the rail network in Halton. Um, considering the state of the public finances, do you think there's, it's feasible that any improvements could be made in Halton, and if so, what? Sorry, I didn't catch. Did you say the, the rail network? The rail network. Ineos Claw said uh, there was a lack of political will to invest in rail infrastructure in Halton. And the Green Party said it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was inadequate. For you, Chair, there, there certainly isn't any uh, lack of uh, political will in Holton to invest in rail. Obviously, rail, being the, the, the expensive infrastructure it is, uh, it's certainly beyond Holton's means as a council to, to provide such infrastructure. But we're certainly trying to uh, encourage and work with uh, as many partners as we can. For example, the Holton Curve, uh, which is a scene that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. The, the council is doing his utmost to promote that scheme. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy. Uh, Mersey Travel are actually the, the promoter of that scheme, but we're giving as much support as we possibly can to it. Uh, 3MG is obviously highly dependent on rail, um, and we've worked, I think, very successfully with 3MG in, in, in delivering what is a world-class facility. So, as a council, Holton is, is doing its utmost to promote whatever rail, rail schemes it can. I don't think you have the microphone if you wish to come back. But if you do wish to come back, just put your hand up and I'll, I'll come to you. Now, there was a, a question from the centre of the floor. Hi, um, it's Catherine Wignall, Drivers Jonas Deloitte. Um, a question for Peter. Um, with regards to the attraction of inward investment from the emerging economies, uh, what barriers to entry are currently being faced and what are Peel and the local authorities working to overcome them? China looking and making hopefully contacts there, uh, working with UKTI in the Middle East as well. So I think it's a case of uh, getting out into the emerging markets. Uh, I think one of the areas that they're interested in is reciprocal deals, so they want you to get involved in their markets as well, uh, and that's certainly an area where government could help to deliver that. Um, in terms of actually how that is then managed uh, within the UK, I think when you're looking at these emerging markets, what they want to know is, is there a big product with which they can get involved? What's the full potential of the market? And that's one of the areas we're working at really across the whole region, um, not just our own schemes, but other people's schemes as well, to, to say to those emerging markets, well, here's a, here's a big basket of schemes. Uh, and that's one of the objectives really of Atlantic Gateway. It's almost like a, a marketing tool, like a shop. All the schemes are on the shelves. You use the headline name to get people in the shop, and then the individual goods can sell themselves to, to the consumer. So uh, it's an area which is in getting increasing focus, uh, much more contact with central government as some of the regional bodies fall away. That's important that we do get contact with central government to help us deliver those opportunities. Could I ask, for my benefit, what, what exactly is a reciprocal agreement and how can government do more? What, what the 
Chinese or Middle Eastern companies want to know is that they want access to our markets, but they also want you to partake and, and make a commitment to their markets. And it's understanding their markets as to what that might mean, because you're dealing with a whole different set of uh, rules and regulations by which to work. So you really need to understand um, much more uh, help is needed to enable you to actually appreciate what might be entailed in getting involved in those markets. And government can oil the wheels. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. Um, hello, it's uh, Julian Garrett from Parsons Brinkhoff. Um, these are all quite exciting schemes we've heard around, uh, you know, anti-gateway, new mercy crossing, uh, these mercy gateway, all, all very exciting. Uh, the question I'd like to ask uh, through you, Chair, but to, to any of the panel members, do you think that the profile of these schemes, of these large point developments, is actually at the detriment of uh, incremental improvements and optimization of the existing uh, infrastructure? I mean, Mercy Gateway is, is, is actually a really good example because it's sucking the due leverage into the overall scheme development. As Steve says, um, the profiles are re reused. But actually, on a lot of schemes, that isn't the case. And I, I wonder what the, the, the sort of panel think of how you achieve the balance between achieving optimization of the existing assets and investing in that, or attracting new money for the big, high profile schemes, because the latter is easier than the former. It's a very interesting question, actually. So, uh, what, what do you think, Malcolm? I mean, is, it, is, is it the case that some things get shoved on the back burner because we're all taken by the glittering prizes on offer in the future? I think my, my initial response to that is something like the bridge is so important that it has to happen because it has an immediate and um, day-to-day impact on the economy of, uh, of Greater Liverpool. Uh, but you're quite right in saying that the existing road infrastructure, for example, in Liverpool, needs uh, continuing investment. We have a, a fairly large backlog of repairs. We have a number of unadopted roads which are part of the main network now, which develops potholes at an extraordinary rate. Um, so the, the movement of the, around the city is affected by this. You'll be aware of all of the road works that have been going on in Liverpool at the present time. A lot of that's been done with money that's been available up to March. Um, we're less clear on how, how much funding will be available. Certainly the integrated transport block for the fixing roads that uh, Mersey Travel has received as, as the Integrated Transport Authority has been reduced by something like 30%. So, but you're quite right in saying there is, a, there is an issue with the existing infrastructure as well. But I think something like the gate is, uh, Mersey's gateway is just so important. If I could follow up on that, and if I could put this to Louise, and you, you may wish to contribute uh, an answer to this question as well, but I suppose a related question is that on the ground, say, in Liverpool and Wirral, there's probably some anxiety about major schemes. And then because the question then is asked, will these be jobs for local people? Will these be homes for local people? Uh, and it's a similar question, isn't it? I mean, the schemes are great, but what if they just attract you know, gentrification from outside and, you know, and jobs from outside? Is that, is that something we should be worrying about and focusing on? Um, that is something that people do worry about. But I think it's about how projects are dealt with and how they're organised. Uh, certainly in Liverpool, some of the housing regeneration schemes were planned very carefully so that local people were closely involved, uh, could decide which new homes they wanted. So there were efforts were taken to ensure that local people benefited, not only people coming from outside. But it does matter as well that facilities are improved. And if new people come in as well, that also is very good, and not at the expense of local people, but that is good as well. And while I agree that we need to look at local <coughs> things, look at local improvements as they come, and sometimes you can't make the big move without having some, <coughs> some visionaries as well, even though that might be delivered in phases. And certainly on the schemes that we're discussing today, I think they have to be big concepts, and incremental changes wouldn't be lovely enough. Okay, and the gentleman from the Balfour Beatty table, sir. I suppose I ought to confess that I'm a guest of Balfour Beatty in the sense that uh, I'm Chris Jackson from Morgan Sindel. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I, I, we have heard um, a great deal of optimism about a number of projects which have a common theme running through them. 
Well, coming out of that has been a considerable reference to the need and the encouragement for private investment. And I think what I want to put to the panel is, how do you attract that private investment? How do you do that with a process which provides you some economy in procurement and maintain commercial confidentiality from those people who are going to provide that investment and at the same time satisfy public procurement rules? And I think the short part of the question is, if I'm going to spend my money, how do I spend that so that I'm spending it on the product and not the process of getting there? Peter, could I ask you to feel that, do you think? Because I suppose my observation would be that, you know, people say, of course, that these schemes will not really cost the taxpayer anything. So, obviously, luring in that project is set investment is absolutely essential. Can you feel that question for us? Yes, and perhaps we use more innovation in financing that than uh, any other companies, because we're looking at all, all sources, and, and you're right to say some of those want to be confidential sources of... of uh, financing, um, which does create problems when you're going through particular processes of procurement, particularly if the projects in partnership, OGU, etc., all those issues which have to be uh, dealt with. Um, obviously, in terms of bank financing for certain sectors, that, that's quite difficult uh, at the moment um, to, to raise money in advance. But I think, uh, and to sort of go a little bit back to the, the previous questions in some way, what people want is, is confidence. Confidence that when they do invest, these major schemes are, are moving forward positively. Uh, and if you can break through those barriers and, and people become confident that schemes will move ahead, then I believe the investment will flow. And obviously, if you're developing in some quite difficult areas, particularly brownfield land areas, that's essential. But people tend to look for safety in investment. Individual investors or advisors of those investors will want to go with sure bets. So there's a little bit of a herd mentality and you've got to encourage that in some ways to say to people, here's an area where you can confidently invest. It's upside and very limited downside. Uh, and, and that's the key often in moving major projects forward. So if we look at something like Media City, where we've invested heavily in that 600 million pound project. That has brought a lot of other investment from other people in on the back of it uh, because of that confidence that here's going to be a success story, people want to get involved with it, uh, and that helps drive it forward. And on the back of that, other major investments are now taking place within that vicinity. Does that answer your question, sir? I'm, I'm, still, I'm still partially concerned about the whole question about an efficient and smooth process to make certain that the money that is being invested is being well spent on delivering the project rather than on getting to the point at which it is. Okay, does anybody feel that they can put this gentleman's mind at rest? <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. yeah, perhaps, um, okay, you mentioned procurement, but obviously we're all striving to procurement efficient as possibly can within the framework we have to operate in. Sometimes if you sail close to the wind on those frameworks, it takes a lot longer to complete the if you sail close to the wind. So um, I think a big issue in the UK is planning and planning risk. And um, you know, obviously there's a reluctance of the private sector to participate in quite expensive developmental budgets and there's a serious risk that planning will fail. And there's a lot of infrastructure projects that um, who did that lesson, they, they've not uh, accomplished the, the planning process successfully. Uh, when, we, when I first got involved with um, Lizzie Gateway, you know, we recognised that um, you know, the efficiency of the scheme did really offer tremendous opportunity for innovation. And a lot of that expertise was in the buildability of the bridge and the interface between construction methods and design. And we were very keen to try and give the private sector and early involvement. Um, but when we looked into this, you know, what we were really asking the private sector was to perhaps some of £10 million to go through the planning process and then um, crack on and build a bridge. And we, we didn't get a great deal of interest in that, surprisingly. Um, so, um, yeah, I think we, we do what we can within this framework. And I think 
planning risk is something that, in general, like the public sector, maybe a partnership in some instances with the public sector on large infrastructure projects before we have to take a leave. Okay. Thank you, sir. Your question, please. Uh, Paul Ames Gifford. Louise, can I tempt you into the fray? Well, one way could be to <coughs> increase the amount of spending that can be decided locally rather than have to go nationally. That's, that's one thing that could be looked at. And other things are to do with perhaps having a clearer appraisal in terms of government decisions about which projects they'll support and which they won't. We can also reduce time. And I think those are the perhaps two points I could, I'd like to put at this point. Yes, Malcolm. It may be controversial, but, um, and I do have to declare an interest, but perhaps bringing back the NWDA might be actually <laughs> one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> Your phone rang earlier, it was from a bridge building, you told me. <laughs> Does that satisfy you, sir? Okay, any more for any more? And the gentleman at the back right up there will come to you uh, as soon as we can. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Simon Kender. I'm a planning student at the University of Liverpool. Um, and I was wondering, with regards to the Mersey Gateway, how that will have an effect on <coughs> excuse me, the opportunities for rail freight in Merseyside and the North West. Because as Peel Holdings uh, take interest in um, building this uh, big gateway to the Atlantic, which means freight will be coming out of the Merseyside region, coming in internationally, and the government is also um, pressured by international and national ideas about uh, switching to a low carbon economy. So switching to rail and making provisions for rail freight would be, would be better. But the, the Mersey Gateway Bridge seems to favour road transport. And maybe put the question to the panel, does, does, is rail being kind of undermined or overlooked as a possible way of conveying freight to the rest of the UK? Okay, Mick, and then Steve afterwards, if that's okay. I think I would uh, disagree that the rail freight is being on demand, certainly in Holton. Uh, I referred earlier to the, the stop on the 3MG. Uh, I think that, as I said, it is an excellent example of, of where we're actually promoting rail freight. And I think you'll find the LTP, when it comes out, the revised LTP, that it places a, a great emphasis on this. Uh, so I, I think I, I would say that, um, cert certainly in Holton, I think the Liverpool city region, um, we're doing all that we can to, to promote rail freight. And I don't think the, the Mersey Gateway, I take the point about the fact that it, it's there to provide for uh, vehicular traffic movements, but uh, I wouldn't say that there's a direct conflict necessarily with, with rail freight. Uh, I don't know, Steve, I don't know. Well, obviously, um, Mersey Gateway takes a, a travel pattern that's very dispersed. It's, um, it serves you know, many areas of the UK, connecting the Liverpool City region mainly, areas of North Cheshire and North Wales and beyond. And rail itself is, um, it provides a very different, or supplies a very different market. However, having said that, obviously we've got some uh, interchanges right on the uh, landings of the bridge, um, the free energy interchanges, mainly a, rate, a rail freight handling facility, but has a, a significant road interface and effective communication to that type of rail hub will be provided by the Mersey Gateway. So the overall transport system is, is in effect multimodal for freight. Uh, at some stage, most freight ends up on a wagon somewhere, most rail freight. And um, you know, that, that's part of our plan, that's part of the case for actually locating the crossing where it is. Um, interestingly, on a funding perspective, Part of the Mersey Gateway funding package has a support for sustainable transport, which, you know, if we are in a situation where the revenues for this project turn out as expected, that significant other projects could follow on, not, not least the Halton Curve. So there's much more opportunity here because we are really drawing in investment potential 
that will empower the local community to spend on projects that hitherto have been unaffordable. I hope that answers your question. Any more questions from the floor? A gentleman there, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Rob Monaghan, Head of Gateways at Liverpool Vision. Um, quite clear, I think, from the discussion that we've had today that um, certainly the, the money has dried up for uh, some of the larger schemes that were currently taken forward. Um, but the governments have announced uh, 560 million for the sustain Sustainable Transport um, Fund. And um, I just wonder what the panel's thoughts and ideas were about uh, the potential to um, access the 50 million pound pot that sits there for, for the sub-region and what, what tricks and cute ideas um, do they have for um, making sure that we get the, the most out of that fund. Anybody in the Certainly, um, as far as Halton is concerned, we're, we're already uh, looking at how to prepare a bid for the local sustainable transport fund. Uh, initially, our expectation is that uh, we will first of all go for what we call the five, the five million pound pot. Uh, but I know that, uh, and Malcolm might wish to comment on this, the Liverpool city region, uh, as you would expect, they're going to go for a much bigger pot of, of, of the 50 million. And I know that colleagues on Merseyside are already working together, uh, together to put together a bid. Um, I think there's an expectation that they will go for what we call the, the phase one in, in April, uh, but maybe, maybe Malcolm can confirm that. Uh, but it's definitely a pot of money that we're all chasing. Um, one, of, one of the big problems for us will be, uh, as you probably were, is the fact that essentially these schemes do have to be innovative to a certain extent. Uh, they can't just replace what we can, can no longer fund through reduced funding through the likes of the local transport plan. So there, there is going to have to be some uh, original thought into what we do. Uh, it's all about uh, low carbon uh, and actually growing the economy. Um, so there will, there will be a lot of thought going on as to what, what new measures, if we can put it that way, we can introduce. And as I say, I know the, the Liverpool City region, that they've already done an awful lot of work on a licensed sustainable travel city bid and so on, that they probably, in, uh, in all probability, will be utilised as part of this uh, sustainable transport fund bid. Okay, Mark and Mike, in a minute, but uh, sorry, just to beg your pardon, but uh, Louise wants to uh, comment. The, the amount available in the fund is actually less than money that's been withdrawn from other transport plants. Nevertheless, it, it is there. And I, I asked the minister what he would be looking for in bids, and he said he didn't have any clear, any specific ideas. He was looking for innovation, and it had to come from local ideas. So that's the way you have to look at it and try and think of something new. I, I think one of the problems, as I understand it, is that you can actually only put in a joint bid um, and you couldn't have a joint bid accepted and an individual authority uh, bid accepted. <coughs> so one of the things that uh, we'll be doing is to participate in a joint bid from, from local authorities involved in the uh, integrated transport authorities. Um, uh, certainly in terms of encouraging sustainable transport, Liverpool has gone quite a way down that line and uh, I'm interested in taking it further because I think it's part of the transformation of, of Liverpool and certainly part of the transformation of North Liverpool with the Everton Connect route for instance in terms of biking. So, um, Stephen Holcroft, uh, who's one of our officers there, keeps telling me that I should get a, a bike for, for next Christmas, but um, I, haven't, I haven't promised him that yet. Okay, thanks very much. And a gentleman here from the table in the foreground, thank you. Hi, uh, Jack Rowley. I'm a, a director of a regional um, civil engineering business. Uh, Chair, you touched on before a conflict between uh, social economic benefit aspirations and uh, bringing in multinational or even national, international businesses. Uh, with regard specifically, Steve, to the bridge, what, what have you got on the agenda there to try and engender more local chain supply or guarantee chain supply involvement at, that, at the lower level? We have a register of suppliers, some people in this room may already be on that register. Uh, we kicked off our um, consultations with the, the main contractors that could uh, play a part in this, in the delivery of this job this week. Uh, we'll follow that on with a uh, more localised uh, 
seminar for the local supply chain probably in June. And this will sort of build up the, um, the awareness locally of opportunities and we'll make sure that tenders have come to be selected for bidding for Mersey Gateway are fully briefed on that. Is there any more questions? There is. Top left. And just bear with us whilst we get the microphone there. Hi, good afternoon. Hiya. Uh, my name is uh, Mohamed Ati. I've uh, worked on several uh, infrastructure projects. And um, one of the key ideas, is especially to, uh, abroad, is that you know, if there's a, a social and economical uh, development and there's a sort of uh, guidelines and encouragement to local businesses and um, so the, for the approval of, of the locals. And uh, I'm just wondering if there's any initiatives around the around the MC Gateway, if there's if there's uh, if they've been quantified and you know if if, uh, if there are any sort of um, developments it that will be put into play uh, in order for for, for, for the uh, for the development process to continue and for the the full duration, not just during the construction phase, but even even afterwards that there'll be, you know, systems set in place that will uh, that will encourage future so you want, you want to be reassured that the, the, there's yeah, not I mean, a short-term flash in the pan, but that you know that people's well-being is being catered for in the planning of these oper of these projects yeah. 10, 20, 30 years down well, the line. Yeah, local businesses, even during the construction phase, within, within the 18 months and afterwards. Okay. Well, I mean, and Peter, I mean, one of Peel's um, you know, main sort of uh, issues, I guess, or points that they try to make is that this will be very sustainable and it will go the distance and that it will create real jobs locally. I mean, uh, can I put this gentleman's mind at that? of partnerships and this is one of the areas where the partnerships come into play um, there's obviously things that can be done during the construction phase in terms of commitments to employ local labour um, you can build potential engagements with local supply chain although the EOG requirements are such that you have to take and, and offer jobs to, uh, to all comers uh, but it's really building those partnerships and engaging uh, events like today really getting people aware of the projects coming ahead so they can engage with with the developer or, or uh, with the public uh, authorities who are also engaged in that so this is going to be a crucial job for example for the local enterprise partnership coming forward how, how does it ensure that local people do benefit from the major schemes coming forward and that's really a job which has to be done hand in hand between the developer uh, and, the, and the local authority and, and the various a agencies that are delivering things like uh, Mersey Partnership, Mersey Maritime, uh, Liverpool Vision, all crucially important role in developing and, and having to pick up some of the excellent work done previously by the Northwest Development Agency. You can't just let that fall away and, and wither. We've got to really ensure that these follow-on bodies actually are picking up, uh, taking all the evidence base all, all the networking that has been put together and actually taking that forward. Um, but it's easy to say, it's much more difficult to do in reality. Thanks, Peter. Um, I, I'm kind of assuming there are no more questions, which allows me to introduce our final speaker. Oh, I do beg your pardon, I'm so sorry. I was hoping that someone else was asked this question, but it's been so positive so far. My name's uh, Eddie Bowsnet from EBL, we're a local developer and contractor. And um, building this bridge, I'm all for it. It's, it's going to be great for the, the borough for itself. But I have been speaking to a number of people, and they think it's going to be a nail in the coffin for splitting the borough in half. And 15 years from now, it would make sense to split it up. I've tried to convince people that won't happen. What can the panel say about that? Dividing the borough in half, Nick? I've heard similar concerns myself, and um, as a council, we, we would uh, try and put those uh, concerns to bed. We, we don't believe that will happen. Uh, I know there have been uh, views expressed in the, in the local press, for example, that uh, Witness Town Centre at the moment is getting more investment than Runcorn Town Centre, but I can, I can certainly assure the audience that uh, Runcorn Town Centre has not been forgotten, will not be forgotten. In fact, uh, the, the Murder Gateway uh, will give more life for example, to Holton Lee, uh, where there's, there's proposals there for, for developing Holton Lee 
we as a council are also working uh, as fast as we can now, in fact there's colleagues in the room, on plans to develop Runcorn Town Centre. So uh, we don't believe at all that the Murder Gateway will create uh, two separate entities. In fact, we're probably, uh, as a borough, it will help us grow and, and regenerate the borough as one. Okay. It, it has to be said that anybody who's lived in Gates of County Durham, which then became Tyne Weir, um, who's been a leader of a county council which has seen unitary authorities formed, um, that a lot of these things are, are not the, sub the result of economic forces, but just simply of governments meddling in local boundaries. And uh, I think that that's a bigger threat to, to local authorities than, uh, than the bridges. Okay, I'm conscious of two things that time is going on. I'm also conscious that Peter needs to get on a train. Are you keen to make use of our <laughs> transport infrastructure? Just let me know when you are and, and, and you can uh, make your excuses and leave. And I do beg your pardon. Um, I'm going to move on now to introduce our final speaker who's had the, um, the luxury of listening to all of our conversations. So if I may also say thank you so much for your contributions just now. Um, it is greatly appreciated. Um, and our final speaker is Andrew wilson -Holm. He's the Director of Innovation and Strategic Capability at Balfour BT. And uh, he's kind of, kind of put his own perspective on things and perhaps some of what we've heard today. Thanks. Well, Mark, thank you. I've just realised that one of the consequences of moving from being a client for travels for 12 years down to the supply chain is that if you attend question time, you get asked no questions at all. <laughs> I'm not quite sure whether that's a, a, a benefit or not. Um, but uh, going back right the way to your um, introduction, if I can just say, um, it, it seems, firstly, to thank the organisations that have put this sort of debate together, um, that at a time when for the last sort of months and, in a sense, year almost, we've been talking about the downturn and the economic crisis that have dominated our thoughts, here we are in a very constructive environment talking about the opportunities in the North Northwest um, and the economic zone that it defines. And what has been so refreshing about, in a sense, this debate is the notion that it brings together um, far-reaching um, visions from the private sector. It brings together visions and opportunities from the public sector. And it's only likely to work if the two halves um, work in concert together. You know, we're very closely watching the Ocean Gateway opportunities and the £50 billion pounds phased over several decades that will, in this area, in a sense, challenge the Thames Gateway. Um, that will be of a scale to look at the north-south divides and will attract so much international investment. This is of an unprecedented scale. Uh, and alongside um, these visions from Peel, um, the Mersey Gateway that we've heard about today, um, the Hall Lane, the Edge Lane projects, the Western approach that somewhere um, stated, and its connectivity is to what someone has referenced today as the sort of knowledge center in the sense of this region. These are major infrastructure projects. These are going to release some of the redundant facilities and the transport bottlenecks, and in do doing so, create huge prosperity um, and opportunity. But, but I have to observe, and I've spoken to a lot of people over lunch in the sort of the, 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 the horizontal section of the room, and you're all very important people, I slightly um, sense that the really, really important people, and forgive, forgive, forgive my sort of candidates, are sitting at the back. Because here we have groups of people that represent not so much the mega projects, but are looking at some of the smaller projects. Um, the local authorities and the client groups that are looking to provide better public services for reduced budgets. The people who are really under pressure as to how to deliver those public services in the new austerity sort of um, uh, period that we find ourselves in. And I think with so many of the supply side representatives here today, it's a great opportunity for us in a sense to step up and to understand some of the risks that have been taken, some of the complexities as we go forward, and to just sort of represent in a sense a little bit about what we understand these challenges to be and how we can respond to them. And I know that I have a Balfour BT label, label on, but in a sense I want to represent the industry as to how we can listen and hear to some of these issues. Um, I've been in Balfour Beatty for rather less than two years. I was uh, in the army for five, I was with Arab as a consultant for 10, and I was a client with BAA for 12 years. So most of my professional life, certainly recently, has been as a client. I look at risks in a sense through a client eye, 
Um, and I think that I can certainly relate to many of the issues that are going on today. Um, during my time at uh, BAA, I was the program director for Terminal 5, uh, and I suspect that some of you, certainly in this location, will simply be reminded of the rather disastrous opening week that Terminal 5 had. For the previous 20 years, in fact, and for six as far as I was concerned, a fantastic opportunity to challenge the industry, to understand what the risk profile was and to do it in a slightly different way, to bring a different set of values, to have a different level of partnership between the supply and the demand side of the industry and to understand what results that can give you. And in a sense, a lot of the challenges that relate to today, um, and it was really great if you come in to the college over the other side, many of you have seen life's greatest accomplishments are those that are first seen and deemed impossible. And that's the little thought for today as you go over to the Riverside College. Um, and, and it sort of reminds me in a sense of this 30 year plan of some of the projects that have got tied up in the finance and the planning, of some of the medium term projects that seemingly are difficult in terms of where the industries and the sectors are. It needs really great leadership and forethought and development of partnerships with the local supply groups and development groups in order to unlock some of the value that is there to be taken. So my role today is as Innovation and Strategic Capability Director, putting together different combinations of services in order to understand and to meet the risk profiles of the range of different customers and clients that we've heard today. And I know looking at the organisations in the table that there are other parts of the supply chain that are doing a great job in putting together those combinations of services. I also know, having been a customer and a client myself, it is very difficult to create the right environment and the right procurement route through which you can provide that perfect environment where all the dots line up and the value chains are created and the waste in a sense minimised. And I say that um, I've been very much part of the industry programme to try and modernise UK construction. And Egan launched his report more than 10 years ago now. He offered customers and supply chains the opportunity to learn from manufacturing and from aerospace and from industry. And if you drag some of those lessons that those sectors had to take on board, then you can find efficiency savings in how you deliver major capital projects and how you manage their life cycles. And those are savings in terms of reliability, program time, and cost, and cost of up to 30%. I was asked um, 18 months ago now to write a follow-up report to, to Egan, uh, and with the prediction of a 30% reduction in the spending in both public and private sector with a carbon agenda that has now arrived. It's not here for us to wait over the next four or five years. It is here. And we're seeming stubbornness in the industry not to change, change the way we do things. I call that report never wasted a good crisis. And I think in a sense the response of this fantastically constructive debate we've had today is for us within the supply chain to raise, to rise to these challenges and to understand some of the risks um, that, 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 that lie ahead of us. And what Mark asked me with a slightly changing brief through the morning is just pick up on some of the sort of points that I've heard. You know, for the fantastic Mersey Gateway project, working in partnership with the Design, Build, Finance, Operate and Maintenance Consortium to help develop the toll strategy that is going to get the balance between the different transport projects and transport corridors, um, and that the output of which is journey time reliability. I say output. You know, much of what we have to do in the supply chain is to understand the business context and the business output of what these regeneration and transport programs are needed. So, um, a huge uh, opportunity for a, a well-defined um, and consortium experience in that work. If I look at the waterside type developments, uh, and I know that um, Peter was asked during one of the questions, how do you equate the long-term vision that is over decades to the short-term positions of where these markets are. And of course, you have to find a way through the undergrowth and tactically put in different parts of those um, sectors as they recover. So partners who can help attract capital investment can bring the supply chains that unlock those transport and infrastructure projects to make way for the commercial, for the retail, and the residential solutions. And as Peter said, you know, it's a bit like going into a sweet shop, I think he said, is that you need to have the frame in the big picture and slowly people will sort of come with the investment as, as and when they see um, the, the ball rolling down the hill and gathering momentum. I've spoken to some local authorities today. We spoke about the conflict between the big national products, the ones that are very visible to the public, 
and the smaller ones, the projects that knit our communities and our society together. Uh, and I certainly have been part of workshops recently with local communities. I know the Parsons Brinkhoff Group are taking a very sort of leading role in this in understanding the complexity of the models that now face lo lo local authorities, in understanding that your local project has to be part of a wider economic zone, that the funding against that is related to growth and in terms of sort of environmental credentials. And these would require different sorts of skills. There's going to be a discontinuity of these local projects as people find and carve their way. And I hope that members of the supply chain, certainly my own organisation, is well up to um, sharing some of the skills that we have to try and find the fastest route to attract either public sector or public private <coughs> sector funding for these local projects. And some of the very non-sexy stuff that we sort of represent in this room, some of the term contracts, some of the minor maintenance works, there are large parts of my organisation, and I know other parts here today, who make it their business to, to do simply three things consistently over a period of time. Um, provide a good customer service, deliver good value for money, and deliver small things on the days. And whether these are potholes, or winter dressing, or small capital pro project works, it is really, really important that the people in this room um, understand the context which the supply chains can help and support through outsourcing or through partnerships uh, in a different way. But there seems to be, and I've picked up this theme, something else that the North West are asking for. Not only to understand the project specific risks and how we can um, assemble ourselves to deal with those, but something um, in terms of delivering a lasting legacy for this area and this region. Uh, and I had a cup of tea earlier this morning with a couple of young lads uh, in, this, in college offices, uh, and they're very worried about the jobs that they may or may not be presented at the end of this. And we've heard on several occasions now that what the supply chains need to do is to be able to take on local people, local engineering organisations, local SMEs, apprentices, training centres, encouraging the young and the people who have a slightly later entry into this business, Perhaps I could offer Malcolm a job here. Um, and to make sure that the investment that is created locally is converted into the capability of this region as growth re-emerges for it to develop its own infrastructure projects with its own trained local resource. And I think the supply chains, whether they are of national or international, have to be able to deliver that local service and understand how you lock into the local communities. Just um, a sort of a couple of other points in a sense. Um, you know, why did I decide therefore to turn my client role into one within the supply chain? If you look at our own organisation, then we have the capability through the recent acquisition of Parsons Brinkhoff to design and provide the strategic consulting. We have a huge depth of capability in terms of being able to deliver programmes. We have an increasing business um, that understands the local maintenance over a period of time. And we have an investment organisation that is able to bring capital. So within one organisation, we're, cer we're certainly not unique here, we can offer a different combination of resources, a different combination of solutions to meet either local or strategic or long-term visions and to understand how you unlock the intrinsic value that is sitting both here uh, and in the wide, wider community. We are certainly not complacent. As I've said on a number of occasions, there's some great organisations in this room. We certainly think we are well placed to take on the next incremental step in improving this UK-based construction and infrastructure investment industry. Uh, and that's the reason that I joined um, Banco BC. People who know me will not be surprised that I finished, in a sense, on the note of safety. Um, there is nothing so important in this industry that you cannot do it safely. And I hope very much that as we um, uh, look forward, hopefully, to some success in supporting the developers, the politicians, the local councils, the local authorities, that we can share everything that we know about safety and about the long-term sustainability of our projects, and that anyone else we work with in the pursuit of that great goal is going to share their knowledge in that too. So thank you to the organisers. Thank you for the opportunity to, in a sense, pull a few of the strands that I've put together. What a fantastic vision there is here for the North East something of a size, of a scale, that is going to really compete with anything else we see in the UK and internationally. I would very much like to feel that the organisation that I represent and that the organisation sitting in this room 
can lift themselves up to the challenge that you're going to offer us to understand the risks. If there's one request that I can ask of you, creating an environment for successful outcomes, understanding the procurement routes against the risk that you're either going to keep on board or pass over is a very difficult and very skillful thing to do. And it needs only to come as a result of some careful thought and preparation. I've seen great projects with the wrong procurement process go wrong. I've seen great projects because of relationships and because of leadership and because of a will to work. And I think, Councillor, you said, you know, friendly for business and a real can-do attitude. That's the sort of leadership that we're looking for to engage these supply chains in understanding more about your risks. And hopefully, in the not too distant future, if we can find our way through the planning and the financial <coughs> long grass, uh, let's get on and start developing this um, great part of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks to Peter, who, as I said, has got to depart south on the high speed train, I hope. Um, Thanks to Andrew for his closing speech, and it does beg the question, has anybody got any questions for Andrew in the life of the conversation? And if not, I'll put one, Andrew, which is, um, right now, what qualities or attitudes do you think suppliers and businesses should be striking to take advantage of and profit from the schemes we've been discussing today? Is there anything missing, do you think? Well, I mean, I think... Um you know, whether you're public or private sector, uh, certainly my own, own organisation takes a very long-term view. Um, if you want to engage in some of the projects here, both locally or at a more sort of strategic level, then you've got to put a footprint down here. You've actually got to make a local investment here. You've got to put offices, you've got to put people down here, and you've got to draw in those local businesses, so, so many people have uh, said. So, in the leadership beyond the, the tactical delivery of a project, Leadership that brings in those skills and creates this lasting legacy. Leadership that so often, you know, in the past two decades has not, I think, sort of um, valued the quality of the relationship. Uh, and too often, I find, having been a client with a very open culture, I want to get to know these guys. I want, I want you to take on risk for me. And I've also seen customers who think, well, let's have an arm's length view of this. Let's take a spot cost price of the day. Let's get value through low cost bidding and the relationship never developed. So the right leadership skills, the right development of relationships, the right value sets against the local communities that you're working in is, I hope, always going to attract and win the eyes of the future customers and the future developers uh, in this region. And uh, I, I supplementary to that, I mean, we began in the afternoon by stating the obvious, which is these are very tough and uncertain times. Is there a certain amount of nerve holding to be going on now for the next 18 months to make sure some of these projects don't falter? Well, I, I was asked to support Treasury recently in putting together their national infrastructure plan. Uh, and in doing so, the various reports that have gone on about the cost of doing infrastructure programs here in the UK versus overseas, uh, the McNulty report in terms of transport. And, and a few things have come out. Visibility of workloads is very important to organisations such as ourselves in investing in the fixed overhead costs. You know, taking on a... a, 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 a group of apprentices to train them for a skill set, for instance, in energy from waste or a new nuclear, takes several years to do. What we'd like to see is a pipeline of work coming through with a, 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 a consistency. And we'd actually rather, rather less work for the consistency than lumpy work when we have to stop and start all the time. So I think the principle to ask, in a sense, is with acknowledging the complexities of the planning and the finance systems, is to bring these, these elements of work together in a way that we can take on the resources, that we can tool up our industries to meet these needs, is going to be much, much better for the long term stability and stable outcome, and much better in terms of reducing the cost of delivery. Okay, thank you very much. Now, I'm looking at my watch, I think it's probably time to draw proceedings to the close. I'd like to thank Dee, Nick, uh, Dickie was here before him, Peter who's fled, and Malcolm, and Louise, and of course, Andrew, and Above all, thank you uh, to you all for being here today. Thanks very much indeed.